Chapter Nineteen of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Nineteen. As meets a rock a thousand waves so Innisfail met Lachlan, Ossian. The trumpets and bagpipes, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death, at once united in the signal for onset, which was replied to by the cry of more than two thousand warriors and the echoes of the mountain glens behind them. Divided into three bodies, or columns, the highland followers of Montrose poured from the defiles which had hitherto concealed them from their enemies and rushed with the utmost determination upon the campbells who waited their charge with the greatest firmness behind these charging columns marched in line the irish under colkitto intended to form the reserve with them was the royal standard and montrose himself and on the flanks were about fifty horse under dalgetty which by wonderful exertions had been kept in some sort fit for service the right column of royalists was led by glengarry the left by lochiel and the centre by the earl of menteith who preferred fighting on foot in a highland dress to remaining with the cavalry the highlanders poured on with the proverbial fury of their country firing their guns and discharging their arrows at a little distance from the enemy who received the assault with the most determined gallantry better provided with musketry than their enemies stationary also and therefore taking the more decisive aim the fire of argyle's followers was more destructive than that which they sustained the royal clans perceiving this rushed to close quarters and succeeded on two points in throwing their enemies into disorder with regular troops this must have achieved a victory but here highlanders were opposed to highlanders and the nature of the weapons as well as the agility of those who wielded them was equal on both sides their strife was accordingly desperate and the clash of the swords and axes as they encountered each other or rung upon the targets was mingled with the short wild animating shrieks with which highlanders accompany the battle the dance or indeed violent exertion of any kind many of the foes opposed were personally acquainted and sought to match themselves with each other from motives of hatred or a more generous emulation of valour neither party would retreat an inch while the place of those who fell and they fell fast on both sides was eagerly supplied by others who thronged to the front of danger a steam like that which arises from a seething cauldron rose into the thin cold frosty air and hovered above the combatants so stood the fight on the right and the centre with no immediate consequence except mutual wounds and death on the right of the campbells the knight of ardenvor obtained some advantage through his military skill and by strength of numbers he had moved forward obliquely the extreme flank of his line at the instant the royalists were about to close so that they sustained a fire at once on front and in flank and despite the utmost efforts of their leader were thrown into some confusion at this instant sir duncan campbell gave the word to charge and thus unexpectedly made the attack at the very moment he seemed about to receive it such a change of circumstances is always discouraging and often fatal but the disorder was remedied by the advance of the irish reserve whose heavy and sustained fire compelled the knight of ardenvor to forego his advantage and content himself with repulsing the enemy 
the marquis of montrose in the meanwhile availing himself of some scattered birch trees as well as of the smoke produced by the close fire of the irish musketry which concealed the operation called upon dalgetty to follow him with the horse and wheeling round so as to gain the right flank and even the rear of the enemy he commanded his six trumpets to sound the charge the clang of the cavalry trumpets and the noise of the galloping of the horse produced an effect upon argyle's right wing which no other sounds could have impressed them with the mountaineers of that period had a superstitious dread of the war-horse like that entertained by the peruvians and had many strange ideas respecting the manner in which that animal was trained to combat when therefore they found their ranks unexpectedly broken and that the objects of their greatest terror were suddenly in the midst of them the panic in spite of sir duncan's attempts to stop it became universal indeed the figure of major dalgetty alone sheathed in impenetrable armour and making his horse caracole and bound so as to give weight to every blow which he struck would have been a novelty in itself sufficient to terrify those who had never seen anything more nearly resembling such a cavalier than a sheltie waddling under a highlander far bigger than itself the repulsed royalists returned to the charge the irish keeping their ranks maintained a fire equally close and destructive there was no sustaining the fight longer argyle's followers began to break and fly most towards the lake the remainder in different directions the defeat of the right wing of itself decisive was rendered irreparable by the death of auchenbreck who fell while endeavouring to restore order the knight of ardenvor with two or three hundred men all gentlemen of descent and distinguished gallantry for the campbells are supposed to have had more gentlemen in their ranks than any of the highland clans endeavoured with unavailing heroism to cover the tumultuary retreat of the common file their resolution only proved fatal to themselves as they were charged again and again by fresh adversaries and forced to separate from each other until at length their aim seemed only to be to purchase an honourable death by resisting to the very last good quarter sir duncan called out major dalgetty when he discovered his late host with one or two others defending himself against several highlanders and to enforce his offer he rode up to him with his sword uplifted sir duncan's reply was the discharge of a reserved pistol which took effect not on the person of the rider but on that of his gallant horse which shot through the heart fell dead under him ronald mackay who was one of those who had been pressing sir duncan hard took the opportunity to cut him down with his broadsword as he turned from him in the act of firing the pistol alan macaulay came up at this moment they were excepting ronald followers of his brother who were engaged on that part of the field villains he said which of you has dared to do this when it was my positive order that the knight of ardenvor should be taken alive half a dozen of busy hands which were emulously employed in plundering the fallen knight whose arms and accoutrements were of a magnificence befitting his quality instantly forbore the occupation and half the number of voices exculpated themselves by laying the blame on the skyman as they called ronald mackay dog of an islander said allan forgetting in his wrath their prophetic brotherhood follow the chase and harm him no farther unless you mean to die by my hand they were at this moment left almost alone for allan's threats had forced his own clan from the spot and all around had pressed onwards toward the lake carrying before them noise terror and confusion and leaving behind only the dead and dying the moment was tempting to mackay's vengeful spirit 
that i should die by your hand red as it is with the blood of my kindred said he answering the threat of allan in a tone as menacing as his own is not more likely than that you should fall by mine with that he struck at macaulay with such unexpected readiness that he had scarce time to intercept the blow with his target villain said allan in astonishment what means this i am ronald of the mist answered the isleman repeating the blow and with that word they engaged in close and furious conflict it seemed to be decreed that in allan macaulay had arisen the avenger of his mother's wrongs upon this wild tribe as was proved by the issue of the present as well as of former combats after exchanging a few blows ronald mackay was prostrated by a deep wound on the skull and macaulay setting his foot on him was about to pass the broadsword through his body when the point of the weapon was struck up by a third party who suddenly interposed this was no other than major dalgetty who stunned by the fall and encumbered by the dead body of his horse had now recovered his legs and his understanding hold up your sword said he to macaulay and prejudice this person no farther in respect that he is here in my safe conduct and in his excellency's service and in regard that no honourable cavalier is at liberty by the law marshal to avenge his own private injuries flagrante bello multo magus flagrante praelio fool said allan stand aside and dare not to come between the tiger and his prey but far from quitting his point dalgetty stepped across the fallen body of mackay and gave allan to understand that if he called himself a tiger he was likely at present to find a lion in his path there required no more than the gesture and tone of defiance to turn the whole rage of the military seer against the person who was opposing the course of his vengeance and blows were instantly exchanged without farther ceremony the strife betwixt allan and mackay had been unnoticed by the stragglers around for the person of the latter was known to few of montrose's followers but the scuffle betwixt dalgetty and him both so well known attracted instant attention and fortunately among others that of montrose himself who had come for the purpose of gathering together his small body of horse and following the pursuit down loch eel aware of the fatal consequences of dissension in his little army he pushed his horse up to the spot and seeing mackay on the ground and dalgetty in the attitude of protecting him against macaulay his quick apprehension instantly caught the cause of quarrel and as instantly devised means to stop it for shame he said gentlemen cavaliers brawling together in so glorious a field of victory are you mad or are you intoxicated with the glory which you have both this day gained it is not my fault so please your excellency said dalgetty i have been known a bonus sacius a bon camarado in all the services of europe but he that touches a man under my safeguard and he said allan speaking at the same time who dares to bar the course of my just vengeance for shame gentlemen again repeated montrose i have other business for you both business of deeper importance than any private quarrel which you may easily find a more fitting time to settle for you major dalgetty kneel down kneel said dalgetty i have not learned to obey that word of command saving when it is given from the pulpit in the swedish discipline the front rank do indeed kneel but only when the regiment is drawn up six file deep nevertheless repeated montrose kneel down in the name of king charles and of his representative when dalgetty reluctantly obeyed montrose struck him lightly on the neck with the flat of his sword saying in reward of the gallant service of this day and in the name and authority of our sovereign king charles 
i dub thee knight be brave loyal and fortunate and now sir dugald dalgetty to your duty collect what horsemen you can and pursue such of the enemy as are flying down the side of the lake do not disperse your force nor venture too far but take heed to prevent their rallying which very little exertion may do mount then sir dugald and do your duty but what shall i mount said the new-made chevalier poor gustavus sleeps in the bed of honour like his immortal namesake and i am made a knight a rider as the high dutch have it just when i have not a horse left to ride upon in german as in latin the original meaning of the word ritter corresponding to aquus is merely a horseman that shall not be said answered montrose dismounting i make you a present of my own which has been thought a good one only i pray you resume the duty you discharge so well with many acknowledgments sir dugald mounted the steed so liberally bestowed upon him and only beseeching his excellency to remember that mackay was under his safe conduct immediately began to execute the orders assigned to him with great zeal and alacrity and you allan macaulay said montrose addressing the highlander who leaning his sword-point on the ground had regarded the ceremony of his antagonist's knighthood with a sneer of sullen scorn you who are superior to the ordinary men led by the paltry motives of plunder and pay and personal distinction you whose deep knowledge renders you so valuable a counsellor is it you whom i find striving with a man like dalgetty for the privilege of trampling the remains of life out of so contemptible an enemy as lies there come my friend i have other work for you this victory skilfully improved shall win seaforth to our party it is not disloyalty but despair of the good cause that has induced him to take arms against us these arms in this moment of better augury he may be brought to unite with ours i shall send my gallant friend colonel hay to him from this very field of battle but he must be united in commission with a highland gentleman of rank befitting that of seaforth and of talents and of influence such as may make an impression upon him you are not only in every respect the fittest for this most important mission but having no immediate command your presence may be more easily spared than that of a chief whose following is in the field you know every pass and glen in the highlands as well as the manners and customs of every tribe go therefore to hay on the right wing he has instructions and expects you you will find him with glen morrison's men be his guide his interpreter and his colleague allan macaulay bent on the marquis a dark and penetrating glance as if to ascertain whether this sudden mission was not conferred for some latent and unexplained purpose but montrose skilful in searching the motives of others was an equal adept in concealing his own he considered it as of the last consequence in this moment of enthusiasm and exalted passion to remove allan from the camp for a few days that he might provide as his honour required for the safety of those who had acted as his guides when he trusted the seer's quarrel with dalgetty might be easily made up allan at parting only recommended to the marquis the care of sir duncan campbell whom montrose instantly directed to be conveyed to a place of safety he took the same precaution for mackay committing the latter however to a party of the irish with directions that he should be taken care of but that no highlander of any clan should have access to him the marquis then mounted a led horse which was held by one of his attendants and rode on to view the scene of his victory which was more decisive than even his ardent hopes had anticipated of argyle's gallant army of three thousand men fully one half fell in the battle or in the flight 
they had been chiefly driven back upon that part of the plain where the river forms an angle with the lake so that there was no free opening either for retreat or escape several hundreds were forced into the lake and drowned of the survivors about one half escaped by swimming the river or by an early flight along the left bank of the lake the remainder threw themselves into the old castle of inverlochy but being without either provisions or hopes of relief they were obliged to surrender on condition of being suffered to return to their homes in peace arms ammunition standards and baggage all became the prey of the conquerors this was the greatest disaster that ever befell the race of diarmid as the campbells were called in the highlands it being generally remarked that they were as fortunate in the issue of their undertakings as they were sagacious in planning and courageous in executing them of the number slain nearly five hundred were dunny vassals or gentlemen claiming descent from known and respected houses and in the opinion of many of the clan even this heavy loss was exceeded by the disgrace arising from the inglorious conduct of their chief whose galley weighed anchor when the day was lost and sailed down the lake with all the speed to which sails and oars could impel her End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty faint the din of battle braid distant down the hollow wind war and terror fled before wounds and death remained behind penrose montrose's splendid success over his powerful rival was not attained without some loss though not amounting to the tenth of what he inflicted the obstinate valor of the campbells cost the lives of many brave men of the opposite party and more were wounded the chief of whom was the brave young earl of menteith who had commanded the centre he was but slightly touched however and made rather a graceful than a terrible appearance when he presented to his general the standard of argyle which he had taken from the standard-bearer with his own hand and slain him in single combat montrose dearly loved his noble kinsman in whom there was conspicuous a flash of the generous romantic disinterested chivalry of the old heroic times entirely different from the sordid calculating and selfish character which the practice of entertaining mercenary troops had introduced into most parts of europe and of which degeneracy scotland which furnished soldiers of fortune for the service of almost every nation had been contaminated with a more than usual share montrose whose native spirit was congenial although experience had taught him how to avail himself of the motives of others used to men teeth neither the language of praise nor of promise but clasped him to his bosom as he exclaimed my gallant kinsman and by this burst of heartfelt applause was men teeth thrilled with a warmer glow of delight than if his praises had been recorded in a report of the action sent directly to the throne of his sovereign nothing he said my lord now seems to remain in which i can render any assistance permit me to look after a duty of humanity the knight of ardenvor as i am told is our prisoner and severely wounded and well he deserves to be so said sir dugald dalgetty who came up to them at that moment with a prodigious addition of acquired importance since he shot my good horse at the time that i was offering him honourable quarter which i must needs say was done more like an ignorant highland caterin who has not sense enough to erect a sconce for the protection of his old 
hurley house of a castle than like a soldier of worth and quality are we to condole with you then said lord menteith upon the loss of the famed gustavus even so my lord answered the soldier with a deep sigh diem classit supremum as we said at the marischal college of aberdeen better so than be smothered like a cager's pony in some flow moss or snow wreath which was like to be his fate if this winter campaign lasted longer but it has pleased his excellency making an inclination to montrose to supply his place by the gift of a noble steed whom i have taken the freedom to name loyalty's reward in memory of this celebrated occasion i hope said the marquis you'll find loyalty's reward since you call him so practised in all the duties of the field but i must just hint to you that at this time in scotland loyalty is more frequently rewarded with a halter than with a horse ahem your excellency is pleased to be facetious loyalty's reward is as perfect as gustavus in all his exercises and of a far finer figure marry his social qualities are less cultivated in respect he has kept till now inferior company not meaning his excellency the general i hope said lord menteith for shame sir dugald my lord answered the knight gravely i am incapable to mean anything so utterly unbecoming what i asseverate is that his excellency having the same intercourse with his horse during his exercise that he hath with his soldiers when training them may form and break either to every feat of war which he chooses to practise and accordingly that this noble charger is admirably managed but as it is the intercourse of private life that formeth the social character so i do not apprehend that of the single soldier to be much polished by the conversation of the corporal or the sergeant or that of loyalty's reward to have been much dulcified or ameliorated by the society of his excellency's grooms who bestow more oaths and kicks and thumps than kindness or caresses upon the animals entrusted to their charge whereby many a generous quadruped rendered as it were misanthropic manifests during the rest of his life a greater desire to kick and bite his master than to love and to honour him spoken like an oracle said montrose were there an academy for the education of horses to be annexed to the marischal college of aberdeen sir dugal dalgetty alone should fill the chair because being an ass said menteith aside to the general there would be some distant relation between the professor and the students and now with your excellency's permission said the new-made knight i am going to pay my last visit to the remains of my old companion in arms not with the purpose of going through the ceremonial of interment said the marquis who did not know how far sir dugald's enthusiasm might lead him consider our brave fellows themselves will have but a hasty burial your excellency will pardon me said dalgetty my purpose is less romantic i go to divide poor gustavus's legacy with the fowls of heaven leaving the flesh to them and reserving to myself his hide which in token of affectionate remembrance i propose to form into a cassock and trousers after the tartar fashion to be worn under my armour in respect my nether garments are at present shamefully the worse of the wear alas poor gustavus why didst thou not live at least one hour more to have borne the honoured weight of knighthood upon thy loins he was now turning away when the marquis called after him as you are not likely to be anticipated in this act of kindness sir dugald to your old friend and companion i trust said the marquis you will first assist me and our principal friends to discuss some of argyle's good cheer of which we have found abundance in the castle most willingly please your excellency said sir dugald as meat and mass never hinder work 
nor indeed am i afraid that the wolves or eagles will begin an onslaught on gustavus to-night in regard there is so much better cheer lying all around but added he as i am to meet two honourable knights of england with others of the knightly degree in your lordship's army i pray it may be explained to them that now and in future i claim precedence over them all in respect of my rank as a banneret dubbed in a field of stricken battle the devil confound him said montrose speaking aside he has contrived to set the kiln on fire as fast as i could put it out this is a point sir dugald said he gravely addressing him which i shall reserve for his majesty's express consideration in my camp all must be upon equality like the knights of the round table and take their places as soldiers should upon the principle of first come first served then i shall take care said menteith apart to the marquis that don dugald is not first in place to-day sir dugald added he raising his voice as you say your wardrobe is out of repair had you not better go to the enemy's baggage yonder over which there is a guard placed i saw them take out an excellent buff suit embroidered in front in silk and silver voto adios as the spaniard says exclaimed the major and some beggarly gilly may get it while i stand prating here the prospect of booty having at once driven out of his head both gustavus and the provant he set spurs to loyalty's reward and rode off through the field of battle there goes the hound said menteith breaking the face and trampling on the body of many a better man than himself and as eager on his sordid spoil as a vulture that stoops upon carrion yet this man the world calls a soldier and you my lord select him as worthy of the honours of chivalry if such they can at this day be termed you have made the collar of knighthood the decoration of a mere bloodhound what could i do said montrose i had no half-picked bones to give him and bribed in some manner he must be i cannot follow the chase alone besides the dog has good qualities if nature has given him such said menteith habit has converted them into feelings of intense selfishness he may be punctilious concerning his reputation and brave in the execution of his duty but it is only because without these qualities he cannot rise in the service nay his very benevolence is selfish he may defend his companion while he can keep his feet but the instant he is down sir dugald will be as ready to ease him of his purse as he is to convert the skin of gustavus into a buff jerkin and yet if all this were true cousin answered montrose there is something convenient in commanding a soldier upon whose motives and springs of action you can calculate to a mathematical certainty a fine spirit like yours my cousin alive to a thousand sensations to which this man's is as impervious as his corslet it is for such that thy friend must feel while he gives his advice then suddenly changing his tone he asked menteith when he had seen annot lyle the young earl coloured deeply and answered not since last evening excepting he added with hesitation for one moment about half an hour before the battle began my dear menteith said montrose very kindly were you one of the gay cavaliers of whitehall who are in their way as great self-seekers as our friend dalgetty should i need to plague you with inquiring into such an amoret as this it would be an intrigue only to be laughed at but this is the land of enchantment where nets strong as steel are wrought out of ladies' tresses, and you are exactly the destined knight to be so fettered. This poor girl is exquisitely beautiful, and has talents formed to captivate your romantic temper. You cannot think of injuring her. You cannot think of marrying her. My lord, replied Menteith, 
you have repeatedly urged this jest for so i trust it is meant somewhat beyond bounds annot lyle is of unknown birth a captive the daughter probably of some obscure outlaw a dependent on the hospitality of the macaulays do not be angry menteith said the marquis interrupting him you love the classics although not educated at marshall college and you may remember how many gallant hearts captive beauty has subdued movet ajacem talamon natum forma captiva dominum tecmase in a word i am seriously anxious about this i should not have time perhaps he added very gravely to trouble you with my lectures on the subject were your feelings and those of annot alone interested but you have a dangerous rival in allan macaulay and there is no knowing to what extent he may carry his resentment it is my duty to tell you that the king's service may be much prejudiced by dissensions betwixt you my lord said menteith i know what you mean is kind and friendly i hope you will be satisfied when i assure you that allan macaulay and i have discussed this circumstance and that i have explained to him that it is utterly remote from my character to entertain dishonourable views concerning this unprotected female so on the other hand the obscurity of her birth prevents my thinking of her upon other terms i will not disguise from your lordship what i have not disguised from macaulay that if annot lyle were born a lady she should share my name and rank as matters stand it is impossible this explanation i trust will satisfy your lordship as it has satisfied a less reasonable person montrose shrugged his shoulders and like true champions in romance he said you have agreed that you are both to worship the same mistress as idolaters do the same image and that neither shall extend his pretensions farther i did not go so far my lord answered menteith i only said in the present circumstances and there is no prospect of their being changed i could in duty to myself and family stand in no relation to annot lyle but as that of friend or brother but your lordship must excuse me i have said he looking at his arm round which he had tied his handkerchief a slight hurt to attend to a wound asked montrose anxiously let me see it alas he said i should have heard nothing of this had i not ventured to tent and sound another more secret and more rankling one menteith i am sorry for you i too have known but what avails it to awake sorrows which have long slumbered so saying he shook hands with his noble kinsman and walked into the castle annot lyle as was not unusual for females in the highlands was possessed of a slight degree of medical and even surgical skill it may readily be believed that the profession of surgery or medicine as a separate art was unknown and the few rude rules which they observed were entrusted to women or to the aged whom constant casualties afforded too much opportunity of acquiring experience the care and attention accordingly of annot lyle her attendants and others acting under her direction had made her services extremely useful during this wild campaign and most readily had these services been rendered to friend and foe wherever they could be most useful she was now in an apartment of the castle anxiously superintending the preparation of vulnerary herbs to be applied to the wounded receiving reports from different females respecting those under their separate charge and distributing what means she had for their relief when allan macaulay suddenly entered the apartment she started for she had heard that he had left the camp upon a distant mission and however accustomed she was to the gloom of his countenance it seemed at present to have even a darker shade than usual he stood before her perfectly silent and she felt the necessity of being the first to speak i thought she said with some effort 
you had already set out my companion awaits me said ellen i go instantly yet still he stood before her and held her by the arm with a pressure which though insufficient to give her pain made her sensible of his great personal strength his hand closing on her like the grip of a manacle shall i take the harp she said in a timid voice is is the shadow falling upon you instead of replying he led her to the window of the apartment which commanded a view of the field of the slain with all its horrors it was thick spread with dead and wounded and the spoilers were busy tearing the clothes from the victims of war and feudal ambition with as much indifference as if they had not been of the same species and themselves exposed perhaps to-morrow to the same fate does the sight please you said macaulay it is hideous said annet covering her eyes with her hands how can you bid me look upon it you must be inured to it said he if you remain with this destined host you will soon have to search such a field for my brother's corpse for menteith's for mine but that will be a more indifferent task you do not love me this is the first time you have taxed me with unkindness said annet weeping you are my brother my preserver my protector and can i then but love you but your hour of darkness is approaching let me fetch my harp remain said ellen still holding her fast be my visions from heaven or hell or from the middle sphere of disembodied spirits or be they as the saxons hold but the delusions of an overheated fancy they do not now influence me i speak the language of the natural of the visible world you love not me annet you love menteith by him you are beloved again and allan is no more to you than one of the corpses which encumber yonder heath it cannot be supposed that this strange speech conveyed any new information to her who was thus addressed no woman ever lived who could not in the same circumstances have discerned long since the state of her lover's mind but by thus suddenly tearing off the veil thin as it was allan prepared her to expect consequences violent in proportion to the enthusiasm of his character she made an effort to repel the charge he had stated you forget she said your own worth and nobleness when you insult so very helpless a being and one whom fate has thrown so totally into your power you know who and what i am and how impossible it is that menteith or you can use language of affection to me beyond that of friendship you know from what unhappy race i have too probably derived my existence i will not believe it said allan impetuously never flowed crystal drop from a polluted spring yet the very doubt pleaded annet should make you forbear to use this language to me i know said macaulay it places a bar between us but i know also that it divides you not so inseparably from menteith hear me my beloved annet leave this scene of terrors and danger go with me to kintail i will place you in the house of the noble lady of seaforth or you shall be removed in safety to icalmkill where some women yet devote themselves to the worship of god after the custom of our ancestors you consider not what you ask of me replied annet to undertake such a journey under your sole guardianship were to show me less scrupulous than maiden ought i will remain here allan here under the protection of the noble montrose and when his motions next approach the lowlands i will contrive some proper means to relieve you of one who has she knows not how become an object of dislike to you allan stood as if uncertain whether to give way to sympathy with her distress or to anger at her resistance annet he said you know too well how little your words apply to my feelings towards you but you avail yourself of your power and you rejoice in my departure 
as removing a spy upon your intercourse with menteith but beware both of you he added in a stern tone for when was it ever heard that an injury was offered to allan macaulay for which he exacted not tenfold vengeance so saying he pressed her arm forcibly pulled the bonnet over his brows and strode out of the apartment End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty one after you're gone i grew acquainted with my heart and searched what stirred it so alas i found it love yet far from lust for could i but have lived in presence of you i had had my end philister annet lyle had now to contemplate the terrible gulf which allan macaulay's declaration of love and jealousy had made to open around her it seemed as if she was tottering on the very brink of destruction and was at once deprived of every refuge and of all human assistance she had long been conscious that she loved menteith dearer than a brother indeed how could it be otherwise considering their early intimacy the personal merit of the young nobleman his assiduous attentions and his infinite superiority in gentleness of disposition and grace of manners over the race of rude warriors with whom she lived but her affection was of that quiet timid meditative character which sought rather a reflected share in the happiness of the beloved object than formed more presumptuous or daring hopes a little gaelic song in which she expressed her feelings has been translated by the ingenious and unhappy andrew macdonald and we willingly transcribe the lines wert thou like me in life's low vale with thee how blessed that lot i'd share with thee i'd fly wherever gale would waft or bounding galley bear but parted by severe decree far different must our fortunes prove may thine be joy enough for me to weep and pray for him i love the pangs this foolish heart must feel when hope shall be for ever flown no sullen murmur shall reveal no selfish murmurs ever own nor will i through life's weary years like a pale drooping mourner move while i can think my secret tears may wound the heart of him i love the furious declaration of allan had destroyed the romantic plan which she had formed of nursing in secret her pensive tenderness without seeking any other requital long before this she had dreaded allan as much as gratitude and a sense that he softened towards her a temper so haughty and so violent could permit her to do but now she regarded him with unalloyed terror which a perfect knowledge of his disposition and of his preceding history too well authorized her to entertain whatever was in other respects the nobleness of his disposition he had never been known to resist the wilfulness of passion he walked in the house and in the country of his fathers like a tamed lion whom no one dared to contradict lest they should awaken his natural vehemence of passion so many years had elapsed since he had experienced contradiction or even expostulation that probably nothing but the good strong sense which on all points his mysticism accepted formed the ground of his character prevented his proving an annoyance and terror to the whole neighbourhood but annet had no time to dwell upon her fears being interrupted by the entrance of sir dugald dalgetty it may be well supposed that the scenes in which this person had passed his former life had not much qualified him to shine in female society 
he himself felt a sort of consciousness that the language of the barrack guard-room and parade was not proper to entertain ladies the only peaceful part of his life had been spent at marischal college aberdeen and he had forgot the little he had learned there except the arts of darning his own hose and dispatching his commons with unusual celerity both which had since been kept in good exercise by the necessity of frequent practice still it was from an imperfect recollection of what he had acquired during this pacific period that he drew his sources of conversation when in company with women in other words his language became pedantic when it ceased to be military mistress annot lyle said he upon the present occasion i am just now like the half-pike or pontoon of achilles one end of which could wound and the other cure a property belonging neither to spanish pike brown bill partisan halberd lockaber axe or indeed any other modern staff weapon whatever this compliment he repeated twice but as annot scarce heard him the first time and did not comprehend him the second he was obliged to explain i mean he said mistress annot lyle that having been the means of an honourable knight receiving a severe wound in this day's conflict he having pistolled somewhat against the law of arms my horse which was named after the immortal king of sweden i am desirous of procuring him such solacement as you madam can supply you being like the heathen god esculapius meaning possibly apollo skilful not only in song and in music but in the more noble art of chirurgery opiferce per orbem decor or if you would have the goodness to explain said annot too sick at heart to be amused by sir dougal's airs of pedantic gallantry that madame replied the knight may not be so easy as i am out of the habit of construing but we shall try decor supply ego i am called opifer opifer i remember signifer and fursifer but i believe opifer stands in this place for m d that is doctor of physic this is a busy day with us all said annot will you say at once what you want with me merely replied sir dugald that you will visit my brother knight and let your maiden bring some medicaments for his wound which threatens to be what the learned call a damnum fatale annot lyle never lingered in the cause of humanity she informed herself hastily of the nature of the injury and interesting herself for the dignified old chief whom she had seen at darlinverach and whose presence had so much struck her she hastened to lose the sense of her own sorrow for a time in the attempt to be useful to another sir dugald with great form ushered annot lyle to the chamber of her patient in which to her surprise she found lord menteith she could not help blushing deeply at the meeting but to hide her confusion proceeded instantly to examine the wound of the knight of ardenvor and easily satisfied herself that it was beyond her skill to cure it as for sir dugald he returned to a large outhouse on the floor of which among other wounded men was deposited the person of ronald of the mist mine old friend said the knight as i told you before i would willingly do anything to pleasure you in return for the wound you have received while under my safe conduct i have therefore according to your earnest request sent mrs annot lyle to attend upon the wound of the knight of ardenvor though wherein her doing so should benefit you i cannot imagine i think you once spoke of some blood relationship between them but a soldado in command and charge like me has other things to trouble his head than with highland genealogies and indeed to do the worthy major justice he never inquired after listened to or recollected the business of other people 
unless it either related to the art military or was somehow or other connected with his own interest in either of which cases his memory was very tenacious and now my good friend of the mist said he can you tell me what has become of your hopeful grandson as i have not seen him since he assisted me to disarm after the action a negligence which deserveth the strapado he is not far from hence said the wounded outlaw lift not your hand upon him for he is man enough to pay a yard of leathern scourge with a foot of tempered steel a most improper vaunt said sir dugald but i owe you some favours ronald and therefore shall let it pass and if you think you owe me anything said the outlaw it is in your power to requite me by granting me a boon friend ronald answered dalgetty i have read of these boons in silly story-books whereby simple knights were drawn into engagements to their great prejudice wherefore ronald the more prudent knights of this day never promise anything until they know that they may keep their word anent the premises without any displeasure or incommodement to themselves it may be you would have me engage the female chirurgian to visit your wound though you ought to consider ronald that the uncleanness of the place where you are deposited may somewhat soil the gaiety of her garments concerning the preservation of which you may have observed women are apt to be inordinately solicitous i lost the favour of the lady of the grand pensionary of amsterdam by touching with the sole of my boot the train of her black velvet gown which i mistook for a footcloth it being half the room distant from her person it is not to bring annet lyle hither answered mackay but to transport me into the room where she is in attendance upon the knight of ardenvor somewhat i have to say of the last consequence to them both it is something out of the order of due precedence said dalgetty to carry a wounded outlaw into the presence of a knight knighthood having been of yore and being in some respects still the highest military grade independent always of commissioned officers who rank according to their patents nevertheless as your boon as you call it is so slight i shall not deny compliance with the same so saying he ordered three files of men to transport mackay on their shoulders to sir duncan campbell's apartment and he himself hastened before to announce the cause of his being brought thither but such was the activity of the soldiers employed that they followed him close at the heels and entering with their ghastly burden laid mackay on the floor of the apartment his features naturally wild were now distorted by pain his hands and scanty garments stained with his own blood and those of others which no kind hand had wiped away although the wound in his side had been secured by a bandage are you he said raising his head painfully towards the couch where lay stretched his late antagonist he whom men call the knight of ardenvor the same answered sir duncan what would you with one whose hours are now numbered my hours are reduced to minutes said the outlaw the more grace if i bestow them in the service of one whose hand has ever been against me as mine has been raised higher against him thine higher against me crushed worm said the knight looking down on his miserable adversary yes answered the outlaw in a firm voice my arm hath been highest in the deadly contest betwixt us the wounds i have dealt have been deepest though thine have neither been idle nor unfelt i am ronald mackay i am ronald of the mist the night that i gave thy castle to the winds in one huge blaze of fire is now matched with the day in which you have fallen under the sword of my fathers remember the injuries thou hast done our tribe never were such inflicted save by one beside thee he they say is fated and secure against our vengeance a short time will show my lord menteith said sir duncan raising himself out of his bed 
this is a proclaimed villain at once the enemy of king and parliament of god and man one of the outlawed banditti of the mist alike the enemy of your house of the macaulay's and of mine i trust you will not suffer moments which are perhaps my last to be embittered by his barbarous triumph he shall have the treatment he merits said menteith let him be instantly removed sir dugald here interposed and spoke of ronald's services as a guide and his own pledge for his safety but the high harsh tones of the outlaw drowned his voice no said he be rack and gibbet the word let me wither between heaven and earth and gorge the hawks and eagles of ben nevis and so shall this haughty knight and this triumphant thane never learn the secret i alone can impart a secret which would make ardenvor's heart leap with joy were he in the death agony and which the earl of menteith would purchase at the price of his broad earldom come hither annot lyle he said raising himself with unexpected strength fear not the sight of him to whom thou hast clung in infancy tell these proud men who disdain thee as the issue of mine ancient race that thou art no blood of ours no daughter of the race of the mist but born in halls as lordly and cradled on couch as soft as ever soothed infancy in their proudest palaces in the name of god said menteith trembling with emotion if you know aught of the birth of this lady do thy conscience the justice to disburden it of the secret before departing from this world and bless my enemies with my dying breath said mackay looking at him malignantly such are the maxims your priests preach but when or towards whom do you practise them let me know first the worth of my secret ere i part with it what would you give knight of ardenvor to know that your superstitious fasts have been in vain and that there still remains a descendant of your house i pause for an answer without it i speak not one word more i could said sir duncan his voice struggling between the emotions of doubt hatred and anxiety i could but that i know thy race are like the great enemy liars and murderers from the beginning but could it be true thou tellest me i could almost forgive thee the injuries thou hast done me hear it said ronald he hath wagered deeply for a son of diarmid and you gentle thane the report of the camp says that you would purchase with life and lands the tidings that annot lyle was no daughter of proscription but of a race noble in your estimation as your own well it is for no love i tell you the time has been that i would have exchanged this secret against liberty i am now bartering it for what is dearer than liberty or life annot lyle is the youngest the sole surviving child of the knight of ardenvor who alone was saved when all in his halls besides was given to blood and ashes can this man speak truth said annot lyle scarcely knowing what she said or is this some strange delusion maiden replied ronald hast thou dwelt longer with us thou wouldst have better learnt to know how to distinguish the accents of truth to that saxon lord and to the knight of ardenvor i will yield such proofs of what i have spoken that incredulity shall stand convinced meantime withdraw i loved thine infancy i hate not thy youth no eye hates the rose in its blossom though it groweth upon a thorn and for thee only do i something regret what is soon to follow but he that would avenge him of his foe must not wreck though the guiltless be engaged in the ruin he advises well annot said lord menteith in god's name retire if if there be aught in this your meeting with sir duncan must be more prepared for both your sakes i will not part from my father if i have found one said annot i will not part from him under circumstances so terrible 
and a father you shall ever find in me murmured sir duncan then said menteith i will have mackay removed into an adjacent apartment and will collect the evidence of his tale myself sir dugald dalgetty will give me his attendance and assistance with pleasure my lord answered sir dugald i will be your confessor or assessor either or both no one can be so fit for i had heard the whole story a month ago at inverary castle but onslaughts like that of ardenvor confuse each other in my memory which is besides occupied with matters of more importance upon hearing this frank declaration which was made as they left the apartment with the wounded man lord menteith darted upon dalgetty a look of extreme anger and disdain to which the self-conceit of the worthy commander rendered him totally insensible End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty two i am as free as nature first made man ere the base laws of servitude began when wild in woods the noble savage ran conquest of granada the earl of menteith as he had undertaken so he proceeded to investigate more closely the story told by ronald of the mist which was corroborated by the examination of his two followers who had assisted in the capacity of guides these declarations he carefully compared with the circumstances concerning the destruction of his castle and family as sir duncan campbell was able to supply and it may be supposed he had forgotten nothing relating to an event of such terrific importance it was of the last consequence to prove that this was no invention of the outlaws for the purpose of passing an impostor as the child and heiress of ardenvor perhaps menteith so much interested in believing the tale was not altogether the fittest person to be entrusted with the investigation of its truth but the examinations of the children of the mist were simple accurate and in all respects consistent with each other a personal mark was referred to which was known to have been borne by the infant child of sir duncan and which appeared upon the left shoulder of annot lyle it was also well remembered that when the miserable relics of the other children had been collected those of the infant had nowhere been found other circumstances of evidence which it is unnecessary to quote brought the fullest conviction not only to menteith but to the unprejudiced mind of montrose that in annot lyle an humble dependent distinguished only by beauty and talent they were in future to respect the heiress of ardenvor while menteith hastened to communicate the result of these enquiries to the persons most interested the outlaw demanded to speak with his grandchild whom he usually called his son he would be found he said in the outer apartment in which he himself had been originally deposited accordingly the young savage after a close search was found lurking in a corner coiled up among some rotten straw and brought to his grandsire kenneth said the old outlaw hear the last words of the sire of thy father a saxon soldier and allen of the red hand left this camp within these few hours to travel to the country to caberfay pursue them as the bloodhound pursues the hurt deer swim the lake climb the mountain thread the forest tarry not till you join them and then the countenance of the lad darkened as his grandfather spoke and he laid his hand upon a knife which stuck in the thong of leather that confined his scanty plaid no said the old man it is not by thy hand he must fall they will ask the news from the camp say to them that annot lyle of the harp 
is discovered to be the daughter of duncan of ardenvor that the thane of menteith is to wed her before the priest and that you are sent to bid guests to the bridal tarry not their answer but vanish like the lightning when the black cloud swallows it and now depart beloved son of my best beloved i shall never more see thy face nor hear the light sound of thy footstep yet tarry an instant and hear my last charge remember the fate of our race and quit not the ancient manners of the children of the mist we are now a straggling handful driven from every vale by the sword of every clan who rule in the possessions where their forefathers hewed the wood and drew the water for ours but in the thicket of the wilderness and in the midst of the mountain kenneth son of eract keep thou unsoiled the freedom which i leave thee as a birthright barter it not neither for the rich garment nor for the stone roof nor for the covered board nor for the couch of down on the rock or in the valley in abundance or in famine in the leafy summer and in the days of the iron winter son of the mist be free as thy forefathers own no lord receive no law take no hire give no stipend build no hut enclose no pasture sow no grain let the deer of the mountain be thy flocks and herds if these fail thee prey upon the goods of our oppressors of the saxons and of such gale as are saxons in their souls valuing herd and flocks more than honour and freedom well for us that they do so it affords the broader scope for our revenge remember those who have done kindness to our race and pay their services with thy blood should the hour require it if a maclan shall come to thee with the head of the king's son in his hand shelter him though the avenging army of the father were behind him for in glencoe and ardna merchant we have dwelt in peace in the years that have gone by the sons of diarmid the race of darnlinvarach the riders of menteith my curse on thy head child of the mist if thou spare one of those names when the time shall offer for cutting them off and it will come anon for their own swords shall devour each other and those who are scattered shall fly to the mist and perish by its children once more be gone shake the dust from thy feet against the habitations of men whether banded together for peace or for war farewell beloved and mayest thou die like thy forefathers ere infirmity disease or age shall break thy spirit be gone be gone live free requite kindness avenge the injuries of thy race the young savage stooped and kissed the brow of his dying parent but accustomed from infancy to suppress every exterior sign of emotion he parted without tear or adieu and was soon far beyond the limits of montrose's camp sir dugald dalgetty who was present during the latter part of this scene was very little edified by the conduct of mackay upon the occasion i cannot think my friend ronald said he that you are in the best possible road for a dying man storms onslaughts massacres the burning of suburbs are indeed a soldier's daily work and are justified by the necessity of the case seeing that they are done in the course of duty for burning of suburbs in particular it may be said that they are traitors and cutthroats to all fortified towns hence it is plain that a soldier is a profession peculiarly favoured by heaven seeing that we may hope for salvation although we daily commit actions of so great violence but then ronald in all services of europe it is the custom of the dying soldier not to vaunt him of such doings or to recommend them to his fellows but on the contrary to express contrition for the same and to repeat or have repeated to him some comfortable prayer which if you please i will intercede with his excellency's chaplain to prefer on your account it is otherwise 
no point of my duty to put you in mind of those things only it may be for the ease of your conscience to depart more like a christian and less like a turk than you seem to be in a fair way of doing the only answer of the dying man for as such ronald mackay might now be considered was a request to be raised to such a position that he might obtain a view from the window of the castle the deep frost mist which had long settled upon the top of the mountains was now rolling down each rugged glen and gully where the craggy ridges showed their black and irregular outline like desert islands rising above the ocean of vapour spirit of the mist said ronald mackay called by our race our father and our preserver receive into thy tabernacle of clouds when this pang is over him whom in life thou hast so often sheltered so saying he sunk back into the arms of those who upheld him spoke no further word but turned his face to the wall for a short space i believe said dalgetty my friend ronald will be found in his heart to be little better than a heathen and he renewed his proposal to procure him the assistance of dr wishart montrose's military chaplain a man said sir dugald very clever in his exercise and who will do execution on your sins in less time than i could smoke a pipe of tobacco saxon said the dying man speak to me no more of thy priest i die contented hadst thou ever an enemy against whom weapons were of no avail whom the ball missed and against whom the arrow shivered and whose bare skin was as impenetrable to sword and dirk as thy still garment heardst thou ever of such a foe very frequently when i served in germany replied sir dugald there was such a fellow at ingolstadt he was proof both against lead and steel the soldiers killed him with the butts of their muskets this impassable foe said ronald without regarding the major's interruption who has the blood dearest to me upon his hands to this man i have now bequeathed agony of mind jealousy despair and sudden death or a life more miserable than death itself such shall be the lot of allan of the red hand when he learns that annet weds menteith and i ask no more than the certainty that it is so to sweeten my own bloody end by his hand if that be the case said the major there's no more to be said but i shall take care as few people see you as possible for i cannot think your mode of departure can be at all creditable or exemplary to a christian army so saying he left the apartment and the son of the mist soon after breathed his last menteith in the meanwhile leaving the new-found relations to their mutual feelings of mingled emotion was eagerly discussing with montrose the consequences of this discovery i should now see said the marquis even had i not before observed it that your interest in this discovery my dear menteith has no small reference to your own happiness you love this new-found lady your affection is returned in point of birth no exceptions can be made in every other respect her advantages are equal to those which you yourself possess think however a moment sir duncan is a fanatic presbyterian at least in arms against the king he is only with us in the quality of a prisoner and we are i fear but at the commencement of a long civil war is this a time think you menteith for you to make proposals for his heiress or what chance is there he will now listen to it passion and ingenious as well as an eloquent advocate supplied the young nobleman with a thousand answers to these objections he reminded montrose that the knight of ardenvor was neither a bigot in politics nor religion he urged his own known and proved zeal for the royal cause and hinted that its influence might be extended and strengthened by his wedding the heiress of ardenvor 
he pleaded the dangerous state of sir duncan's wound the risk which must be run by suffering the young lady to be carried into the country of the campbells where in case of her father's death or continued indisposition she must necessarily be placed under the guardianship of argyle an event fatal to his menteith's hopes unless he could stoop to purchase his favour by abandoning the king's party montrose allowed the force of these arguments and owned although the matter was attended with difficulty yet it seemed consistent with the king's service that it should be concluded as speedily as possible i could wish said he that it were all settled in one way or another and that this fair brisses were removed from our camp before the return of our highland achilles allan macaulay i fear some fatal feud in that quarter menteith and i believe it would be best that sir duncan be dismissed on his parole and that you accompany him and his daughter as his escort the journey can be made chiefly by water so will not greatly incommode his wound and your own my friend will be an honourable excuse for the absence of some time from my camp never said menteith were i to forfeit the very hope that has so lately dawned upon me never will i leave your excellency's camp while the royal standard is displayed i should deserve that this trifling scratch should gain green and consume my sword-arm were i capable of holding it as an excuse for absence at this crisis of the king's affairs on this then you are determined said montrose as fixed as ben nevis said the young nobleman you must then said montrose lose no time in seeking an explanation with the knight of ardenvor if this prove favourable i will talk myself with the elder macaulay and we will devise means to employ his brother at a distance from the army until he shall be reconciled to his present disappointment would to god some vision would descend upon his imagination fair enough to obliterate all traces of annot lyle that perhaps you think impossible menteith well each to his service you to that of cupid and i to that of mars they parted and in pursuance of the scheme arranged menteith early on the ensuing morning sought a private interview with the wounded knight of ardenvor and communicated to him his suit for the hand of his daughter of their mutual attachment sir duncan was aware but he was not prepared for so early a declaration on the part of menteith he said at first that he had already perhaps indulged too much in feelings of personal happiness at a time when his clan had sustained so great a loss and humiliation and that he was unwilling therefore farther to consider the advancement of his own house at a period so calamitous on the more urgent suit of the noble lover he requested a few hours to deliberate and consult with his daughter upon a question so highly important the result of this interview and deliberation was favourable to menteith sir duncan campbell became fully sensible that the happiness of his new-found daughter depended upon a union with her lover and unless such were now formed he saw that argyle would throw a thousand obstacles in the way of a match in every respect acceptable to himself menteith's private character was so excellent and such was the rank and consideration due to his fortune and family that they outbalanced in sir duncan's opinion the difference in their political opinions nor could he have resolved perhaps had his own opinion of the match been less favourable to decline an opportunity of indulging the new-found child of his hopes there was besides a feeling of pride which dictated his determination to produce the heiress of ardenvor to the world as one who had been educated a poor dependent and musician in the family of darnlinvarach had something in it that was humiliating to introduce her as the betrothed bride or wedded wife of the earl of menteith upon an attachment formed during her obscurity was a warrant to the world that she had at all times 
been worthy of the rank to which she was elevated it was under the influence of these considerations that sir duncan campbell announced to the lovers his consent that they should be married in the chapel of the castle by montrose's chaplain and as privately as possible but when montrose should break up from inverlochy for which orders were expected in the course of a very few days it was agreed that the young countess should depart with her father to his castle and remain there until the circumstances of the nation permitted menteith to retire with honour from his present military employment his resolution being once taken sir duncan campbell would not permit the maidenly scruples of his daughter to delay its execution and it was therefore resolved that the bridal should take place the next evening being the second after the battle End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter twenty three my maid my blue-eyed maid he bore away due to the toils of many a bloody day iliad it was necessary for many reasons that angus macaulay so long the kind protector of annot lyle should be made acquainted with the change in the fortunes of his late protege and montrose as he had undertaken communicated to him these remarkable events with the careless and cheerful indifference of his character he expressed much more joy than wonder at annot's good fortune had no doubt whatever she would merit it and as she had always been bred in loyal principles would convey the whole estate of her grim fanatical father to some honest fellow who loved the king i should have no objection that my brother allan should try his chance added he notwithstanding that sir duncan campbell was the only man who ever charged darnlinvarach with inhospitality annot lyle could always charm allan out of the sullens and who knows whether matrimony might not make him more of a man of this world montrose hastened to interrupt the progress of his castle-building by informing him that the lady was already wooed and won and with her father's approbation was almost immediately to be wedded to his kinsman the earl of menteith and that in testimony of the high respect due to macaulay so long the lady's protector he was now to request his presence at the ceremony macaulay looked very grave at this intimation and drew up his person with the air of one who thought that he had been neglected he contrived he said that his uniform kind treatment of the young lady while so many years under his roof required something more upon such an occasion than a bare compliment of ceremony he might he thought without arrogance have expected to have been consulted he wished his kinsman of menteith well no man could wish him better but he must say he thought he had been hasty in this matter allan's sentiments toward the young lady had been pretty well understood and he for one could not see why the superior pretensions which he had upon her gratitude should have been set aside without at least undergoing some previous discussion montrose seeing too well where all this pointed entreated macaulay to be reasonable and to consider what probability there was that the knight of ardenbor could be brought to confer the hand of his sole heiress upon allan whose undeniable excellent qualities were mingled with others by which they were overclouded in a manner that made all tremble who approached him my lord said angus macaulay my brother allan has as god made us all faults as well as merits but he is the best and bravest man of your army 
be the other who he may and therefore ill deserved that his happiness should have been so little consulted by your excellency by his own near kinsman and by a young person who owes all to him and to his family montrose in vain endeavoured to place the subject in a different view this was the point in which angus was determined to regard it and he was a man of that calibre of understanding who is incapable of being convinced when he has once adopted a prejudice montrose now assumed a higher tone and called upon angus to take care how he nourished any sentiments which might be prejudicial to his majesty's service he pointed out to him that he was peculiarly desirous that allan's efforts should not be interrupted in the course of his present mission a mission he said highly honourable for himself and likely to prove most advantageous to the king's cause he expected his brother would hold no communication with him upon other subjects nor stir up any cause of dissension which might divert his mind from a matter of such importance angus answered somewhat sulkily that he was no machabate or stirrer up of quarrels he would rather be a peacemaker his brother knew as well as most men how to resent his own quarrels as for allan's mode of receiving information it was generally believed he had other sources than those of ordinary couriers he should not be surprised if they saw him sooner than they expected a promise that he would not interfere was the farthest to which montrose could bring this man thoroughly good-tempered as he was on all occasions save when his pride interest or prejudices were interfered with and at this point the marquis was fain to leave the matter for the present a more willing guest at the bridal ceremony certainly a more willing attendant at the marriage feast was to be expected in sir dugald dalgetty whom montrose resolved to invite as having been a confidant to the circumstances which preceded it but even sir dugald hesitated looked on the elbows of his doublet and the knees of his leather breeches and mumbled out a sort of reluctant acquiescence in the invitation providing he should find it possible after consulting with the noble bridegroom montrose was somewhat surprised but scorning to testify displeasure he left sir dugald to pursue his own course this carried him instantly to the chamber of the bridegroom who amidst the scanty wardrobe which his camp equipage afforded was seeking for such articles as might appear to the best advantage upon the approaching occasion sir dugald entered and paid his compliments and with a very grave face upon his approaching happiness which he said he was very sorry he was prevented from witnessing in plain truth said he i should but disgrace the ceremony seeing that i lack a bridal garment rents and open seams and tatters at elbows in the apparel of the assistants might presage a similar solution of continuity in your matrimonial happiness and to say truth my lord you yourself must partly have the blame of this disappointment in respect you sent me upon a fool's errand to get a buff coat out of the booty taken by the camerons whereas you might as well have sent me to fetch a pound of fresh butter out of a black dog's throat i had no answer my lord but brandished dirks and broadswords and a sort of growling and jabbering in what they call their language for my part i believe these highlanders to be no better than absolute pagans and have been much scandalized by the manner in which my acquaintance ronald mackay was pleased to beat his final march a little while since in menteith's state of mind disposed to be pleased with everything and everybody the grave complaint of sir dugald furnished additional amusement he requested his acceptance of a very handsome buff dress which was lying on the floor i had intended it he said for my own bridal garment as being the least formidable of my warlike equipments and i have here no peaceful dress 
sir dugald made the necessary apologies would not by any means deprive and so forth until it happily occurred to him that it was much more according to military rule that the earl should be married in his back and breast pieces which dress he had seen the bridegroom wear at the union of prince leo of Wittelsbach with the youngest daughter of old george frederick of saxony under the auspices of the gallant gustavus adolphus the lion of the north and so forth the good-natured young earl laughed and acquiesced and thus having secured at least one merry face at his bridal he put on a light and ornamented cuirass concealed partly by a velvet coat and partly by a broad blue silk scarf which he wore over his shoulder agreeably to his rank and the fashion of the times everything was now arranged and it had been settled that according to the custom of the country the bride and bridegroom should not again meet until they were before the altar the hour had already struck that summoned the bridegroom thither and he only waited in a small anteroom adjacent to the chapel for the marquis who condescended to act as bride's man upon the occasion business relating to the army having suddenly required the marquis's instant attention menteith waited his return it may be supposed in some impatience and when he heard the door of the apartment open he said laughing you are late upon parade you will find i am too early said allan macaulay who burst into the apartment draw menteith and defend yourself like a man or die like a dog you are mad allan answered menteith astonished alike at his sudden appearance and at the unutterable fury of his demeanour his cheeks were livid his eyes started from their sockets his lips were covered with foam and his gestures were those of a demoniac you lie traitor was his frantic reply you lie in that as you lie in all you have said to me your life is a lie did i not speak my thoughts when i called you mad said menteith indignantly your own life were a brief one in what do you charge me with deceiving you you told me answered macaulay that you would not marry annet lyle false traitor she now waits you at the altar it is you who speak false retorted menteith i told you the obscurity of her birth was the only bar to our union that is now removed and whom do you think yourself that i should yield up my pretensions in your favour draw then said macaulay we understand each other not now said menteith and not here allan you know me well wait till to-morrow and you shall have fighting enough this hour this instant or never answered macaulay your triumph shall not go farther than the hour which is stricken menteith i entreat you by our relationship by our joint conflicts and labours draw your sword and defend your life as he spoke he seized the earl's hand and wrung it with such frantic earnestness that his grasp forced the blood to start under the nails menteith threw him off with violence exclaiming begone madman then be the vision accomplished said allan and drawing his dirk struck with his whole gigantic force at the earl's bosom the temper of the corslet threw the point of the weapon upwards but a deep wound took place between the neck and shoulder and the force of the blow prostrated the bridegroom on the floor montrose entered at one side of the anteroom the bridal company alarmed at the noise were in equal apprehension and surprise but ere montrose could almost see what had happened allan macaulay had rushed past him and descended the castle stairs like lightning guards shut the gate exclaimed montrose seize him kill him if he resists he shall die if he were my brother but allan prostrated with a second blow of his dagger a sentinel who was upon duty traversed the camp like a mountain deer though pursued by all who caught the alarm threw himself into the river and swimming to the opposite side was soon lost among the woods 
in the course of the same evening his brother angus and his followers left montrose's camp and taking the road homeward never again rejoined him of allan himself it is said that in a wonderfully short space after the deed was committed he burst into a room in the castle of inverary where argyle was sitting in council and flung on the table his bloody dirk is it the blood of james graham said argyle a ghastly expression of hope mixing with the terror which the sudden apparition naturally excited it is the blood of his minion answered macaulay it is the blood which i was predestined to shed though i would rather have spilt my own having thus spoken he turned and left the castle and from that moment nothing certain is known of his fate as the boy kenneth with three of the children of the mist were seen soon afterwards to cross loch fine it is supposed they dogged his course and that he perished by their hand in some obscure wilderness another opinion maintains that allan macaulay went abroad and died a monk of the carthusian order but nothing beyond bare presumption could ever be brought in support of either opinion his vengeance was much less complete than he probably fancied for menteith though so severely wounded as to remain long in a dangerous state was by having adopted major dalgetty's fortunate recommendation of a cuirass as a bridal garment happily secured from the worst consequences of the blow but his services were lost to montrose and it was thought best that he should be conveyed with his intended countess now truly a mourning bride and should accompany his wounded father-in-law to the castle of sir duncan at ardenvoir dalgetty followed them to the water's edge reminding menteith of the necessity of erecting a sconce on drumsnab to cover his lady's newly acquired inheritance they performed their voyage in safety and menteith was in a few weeks so well in health as to be united to annet in the castle of her father the highlanders were somewhat puzzled to reconcile menteith's recovery with the visions of the second sight and the more experienced seers were displeased with him for not having died but others thought the credit of the vision sufficiently fulfilled by the wound inflicted by the hand and with the weapon foretold and all were of opinion that the incident of the ring with the death's head related to the death of the bride's father who did not survive her marriage many months the incredulous held that all this was idle dreaming and that allan's supposed vision was but a consequence of the private suggestions of his own passion which having long seen in menteith a rival more beloved than himself struggled with his better nature and impressed upon him as it were involuntarily the idea of killing his competitor menteith did not recover sufficiently to join montrose during his brief and glorious career and when that heroic general disbanded his army and retired from scotland menteith resolved to adopt the life of privacy which he led till the restoration after that happy event he occupied a situation in the land befitting his rank lived long happy alike in public regard and in domestic affection and died at a good old age our dramatis personae have been so limited that excepting montrose whose exploits and fate are the theme of history we have only to mention sir dugald dalgetty this gentleman continued with the most rigorous punctuality to discharge his duty and to receive his pay until he was made prisoner among others upon the field of philiphaw he was condemned to share the fate of his fellow-officers upon that occasion who were doomed to death rather by denunciations from the pulpit than the sentence either of civil or military tribunal their blood being considered as a sort of sin-offering to take away the guilt of the land and the fate imposed upon the canaanites under a special dispensation being impiously and cruelly applied to them 
several lowland officers in the service of the covenanters interceded for dalgetty on this occasion representing him as a person whose skill would be useful in their army and who would be readily induced to change his service but on this point they found sir dugald unexpectedly obstinate he had engaged with the king for a certain term and till that was expired his principles would not permit any shadow of changing the covenanters again understood no such nice distinction and he was in the utmost danger of falling a martyr not to this or that political principle but merely to his own strict ideas of a military enlistment fortunately his friends discovered by computation that there remained but a fortnight to elapse of the engagement he had formed and to which though certain it was never to be renewed no power on earth could make him false with some difficulty they procured a reprieve for this short space after which they found him perfectly willing to come under any engagements they chose to dictate he entered the service of the estates accordingly and wrought himself forward to be major in gilbert kerr's corps commonly called the kirk's own regiment of horse of his farther history we know nothing until we find him in possession of his paternal estate of drumthwacket which he acquired not by the sword but by a pacific intermarriage with hannah strachan a matron somewhat stricken in years the widow of the aberdeenshire covenanter sir dugald is supposed to have survived the revolution as traditions of no very distant date represent him as cruising about in that country very old very deaf and very full of interminable stories about the immortal gustavus adolphus the lion of the north and the bulwark of the protestant faith reader the tales of my landlord are now finally closed closed and it was my purpose to have addressed thee in the vein of jedediah cleechbotham but like horam the son of asmar and all other imaginary story-tellers jedediah has melted into thin air mr cleechbotham bore the same resemblance to ariel as he at whose voice he rose doth to the sage prospero and yet so fond are we of the fictions of our own fancy that i part with him and all his imaginary localities with idle reluctance i am aware this is a feeling in which the reader will little sympathize but he cannot be more sensible than i am that sufficient varieties have now been exhibited of the scottish character to exhaust one individual's powers of observation and that to persist would be useless and tedious i have the vanity to suppose that the popularity of these novels has shown my countrymen and their peculiarities in lights which were new to the southern reader and that many hitherto indifferent upon the subject have been induced to read scottish history from the allusions to it in these works of fiction i retire from the field conscious that there remains behind not only a large harvest but labourers capable of gathering it in more than one writer has of late displayed talents of this description and if the present author himself a phantom may be permitted to distinguish a brother or perhaps a sister shadow he would mention in particular the author of the very lively work entitled marriage End of chapter 23 Appendix 1 of A Legend of Montrose This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott appendix number one the scarcity of my late friend's poem may be an excuse for adding the spirited conclusion of clan alpin's vow the clan gregor has met in the ancient church of balquitter the head of drummond ernoch is placed on the altar covered for a time with the banner of the tribe 
the chief of the tribe advances to the altar and pausing on the banner gazed then cried in scorn his finger raised this was the boon of scotland's king and with a quick and angry fling tossing the pageant screen away the dead man's head before him lay unmoved he scanned the visage o'er the clotted locks were dark with gore the features with convulsions grim the eyes contorted sunk and dim but unappalled in angry mood with lowering brow unmoved he stood upon the head his bared right hand he laid the other grasped his brand then kneeling cried to heaven i swear this deed of death i own and share as truly fully mine as though this my right hand had dealt the blow come then our foemen one come all if to revenge this caitiff's fall one blade is bared one bow is drawn mine everlasting peace i pawn to claim from them or claim from him in retribution limb for limb in sudden fray or open strife this steel shall render life for life he ceased and at his beckoning nod the clansmen to the altar trod and not a whisper breathed around and not was heard of mortal sound save from the clanking arms they bore that rattled on the marble floor and each as he approached in haste upon the scalp his right hand placed with livid lip and gathered brow each uttered in his turn the vow fierce macalm watched the passing scene and searched them through with glances keen then dashed a tear-drop from his eye unhid it came he knew not why exulting high he towering stood kinsman he cried of alpin's blood and worthy of clan alpin's name unstained by cowardice and shame even do spare not in time of ill shall be clan alpin's legend still end of appendix one appendix number two of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott appendix number two it has been disputed whether the children of the mist were actual macgregors or whether they were not outlaws named macdonald belonging to ardnamurchan the following act of the privy council seems to decide the question edinburgh fourth february fifteen eighty nine the same day the lords of secret council being credibly informed of ye cruel and mischievous proceeding of ye wicked clan grigor so long continued in blood slaughters herships manifest rifts and stouts committed upon his highness's peaceable and good subjects inhabiting ye countries ye west ye braes of ye highlands their money years by gone by but specially ere after ye cruel murder of uncle joe drummond of drummany rich his majesty's proper tenant and one of his fosters of glenartney committed upon ye day of last by past be certain of ye said clan be ye counsel and determination of ye hail a vow to defend ye authors rough whatever yald pursue for revenge of ye same col ye said joe was occupied in seeking of venison to his highness at command of pat lord drummond steward of stratharm and principal forester of glenartney the queen his majesty's dearest spouse being yon shortly looked for to arrive in this realm like as after ye murder committed ye authors rough cutted off ye said uncle joe drummond's head and carried the same to the laird of macgregor who and the hale surname of macgregors purposely convened upon the sunday rafter at the kirk of bookwitter yer they caused ye said uncle john's head to be prin to him and ye avowing ye said murder 
to have been committed by your communion counsel and determination laid your hands upon the pow and in ethnic and barbarous manner swear to defend ye authors of ye said murder in most proud contempt of our sovereign lord and his authority and in evil example to others wicked limerous to do ye like give ye sal be suffered to remain unpunished then follows a commission to the earls of huntley argyle athole montrose pat lord drummond jaw commendator of inchifray and campbell of loch Innel, duncan campbell of ardkenglass loch lane mackintosh of dun octane sir joe murray of tillibarden knight george buchanan of that ilk and macfarlane of aracocher to search for and apprehend alister macgregor of glenstray and a number of others nominatum and all others of the said clan grigor or ye assisters capable of the said odious murther or of theft reset of theft herships and sornings quiver they may be apprehended and if they refuse to be taken or flees to strength and houses to pursue and assedge them with fire and sword and this commission to endure for the space of three years such was the system of police in fifteen eighty nine and such the state of scotland nearly thirty years after the reformation end of appendix two